That's very personal, isn't it? <laughs> my name's Peter Clark. I began my life in Surrey, uh, suburbs of London, really, in 1937. We lived in what was the start of a, um, one of the first housing estates. And it was um, one of Lord Ivor's estates. There was probably 50, 60 acres there, which I could walk around and there was some fields and woods and lake. And I used to take the dog for a walk and that. And, you know, mother used to say, well, you know what time lunch is? Um, had a watch and I said, fine. And that was the last time she saw me three or four hours. It was a good life. Um, I was very keen on botany, and that's where I basically learned it from, from birds. So I said, fine, I'm going to go farming now. And in those days, if you had a bit of common sense and a bit of strength, you could actually go farming. And then I joined the Navy for national service. I didn't have to do national service because we were in what we call a reserved occupation, which was uh, mining and farming and, and forestry, but I wanted to see the world. And that was, I was lucky I got on an Admiral's flagship, which was a cruiser, HMS Salon. I was on there for two years, and we visited 28 countries in two years. The slums, I think, were one of the things that got to me. Um, you go outside any port, naval port, um, you get uh, the poorest of the poor around the, uh, around the entrance of the dockyard. I think that really did quite uh, subconsciously affect me because I've always been careful, if you like, with food. Um, you just don't throw it away because these guys are desperate for it. And I think um, it was a very good education. I, I mean, uh, all I wanted to do was go back to farming. It was a challenge for me because none of my family, I think a great, great grandfather had been a farmer sometime, but um, none of my immediate family were farmers. And they looked at me as a bit um, odd. And because uh, I was working as a farm worker uh, for nearly 10 years, uh, living in uh, Thai cottages and being paid a farm worker's wage. But I was learning the job, uh, which was, in, in my view, the way a very good way to learn. My name's Rebecca Lawton. The Land Workers Alliance is a union of um, farmers, growers, forest workers and land-based crafts workers um, that are aiming to produce food, fuel, fibres in a sustainable way. And so, yes, we're a union um, and we also provide training, we do lobbying for um, political lobbying to try and get better policies and support for um, land workers. Um, solidarity is a big part of what we're about because um, farmers tend to work in um, a more isolated way. Um, our members are scattered across the country. While some of them work as part of community supported agriculture schemes or cooperatives, many of them are sole traders or working um, just in couples in isolated places. Uh, we aren't invincible. Um, and we aren't infallible. Uh, they've got their farm and maybe none of the children want to take it on. They don't particularly want to sell it. And so they're going to keep going. And that's the danger where um, they can't do what they used to, where you get accidents or animal welfare problems. And so they're seriously, seriously now thinking of trying to get some way to let the Farmers retire gracefully uh, without being kicked out. They're looking at it um, because this is what is needed now. Because a, it'll save um, it'll save people getting into trouble with animal welfare. But b, it's going to allow the younger generation to come into agriculture who are dying to get in there, who've got modern ideas, and not only that, the land will then be totally farmed the land is not farmed properly. Quite often in rural communities, they might be um, feeling like there aren't many people who are sympathetic to their aims of sustainability and food justice. So 
providing a forum where people can come together and find other people who have similar problems, similar struggles, similar values. That's a really important part of what we're about. So things like our um, AGM, we've turned it into quite a big social event each year, which brings people together. We also, on a regional level, have um, farm walks, bring and share suppers, training courses, and different ways to enable our members to get together and share their skills, but also provide each other with solidarity and friendship and fun. Um, I'm really delighted to have been asked by the Prime Minister to return to DEFRA to lead the government's really ambitious agenda on farming, on fishing, on food, on the rural economy and of course on protecting our natural environment. You've got the anomaly now where you're getting some of the advisors saying that uh, the food industry isn't all that important to this country and farming is definitely not important to this country. Well, I mean, uh, to me, that is a completely mad statement. The person who made it has never been hungry and doesn't know what it's like to be hungry and uh, deserves to go hungry, in my view. When you've got elements in a government, it doesn't matter what um, type of government it is, what persuasion uh, they are, you've got them, it's, farming is considered an expensive commodity to have in the country. Gordon Brown, Tony Blair said that donkeys years ago, um, we'd be cheaper to buy food from abroad. And they actually at the time, they were probably correct. But what they didn't look at, look at was ahead. A lot of things need to change. Our food system is really not working in many, many, on many, many different levels. Um, it's not providing the right kinds of food and the right kinds of food aren't getting to everybody. There's a huge amount of inequality, so we've got the situation where we've got food banks in this country, but we've also got people um, suffering from illnesses of obesity and other dietary related illnesses. And then the food supply system is what we're concerned with, and it's not a sustainable supply system. For far too long we've been neglecting the health of our soils, our water, the biodiversity and the natural environment that we're producing the food in. So we need to be changing many, many of these things. At the moment, we are importing 56% of our vegetables and 16.7% um, of our fruit. Now, um, the fruit, there are quite a lot of fruits that you just can't grow here, like bananas and mangoes and pineapples, um, but that they don't represent um, the majority of the fruit we're eating. There are also, we're also importing a lot of apples, plums and pears. And by growing a much greater diversity of, um, of apples, plums and pears, we could actually be encouraging people to get really excited about those and maybe eat fewer of the tropical fruits. And this would really help people to get excited about them. With vegetables, it's a slightly different picture because most vegetables can actually be grown in the UK, so there's a massive import substitution opportunity. But the thing is, we really, we have to do this because with climate change, um, we can't continue relying on fruit and vegetable imports. Um, lots of the countries we import from, Spain, Egypt, various countries in Africa, are actually in climate sensitive zones where water is going to be running short. And so it's really necessary that we increase our self-sufficiency in fruit and vegetables. We will probably need more home-produced food now than we've ever done, uh, well, certainly since the last war. And there's no reason why we can't produce it. At the moment, the way, um, the way the food economy works is that that kind of food, locally produced organic food, fresh food, is often sold at a premium, which just puts it out of the price range of um, particularly people on a low income, but even just ordinary everyday people see it as a luxury. And one of the things that we're really keen to change is to ensure that sustainably produced food is actually everybody's right. So the right to food is very much at the heart of what we're doing. If you rely on other people, and an awful lot of food does come from abroad, um, if you rely on them and, and rely 
mostly on them rather than producing it here, what's going to happen in, in, if we have another situation like this? And what are we going to eat? And that is uh, something which needs to be actually addressed and seriously addressed. Because it, it's, these guys have never been hungry. There are organisations who um, do try and help, but we've, we haven't got the research and development like we had 50 years ago. There are a huge number of government organisations around the country for research and development uh, for the future of farming. A lot of those have been scrubbed uh, cost, basically. Um, and I think that, that is a, a, where we could have uh, the benefit. If we could have research um, like that and research and development, then the farmers are going to benefit. It's going to benefit not an individual farmer, it's going to benefit everybody, the farmers as well as the public. My name's Peter Clark, and I was born in 1937, August.